I'm the one standing, and I wasn't like all the other guys. <laughs> um, uh, I was born in 1963. My mom uh, was very, very young, only 15 years old. She'd met uh, a Puerto Rican dude on the streets of the Lower East Side. It was West Side Story, and uh, uh, the unfortunate end there was me, <laughs> because um, the, the parents were not too crazy about the situation. Um, uh, I was born in uh, uh, a hospital on Staten Island, um, an adjunct to a home for women who uh, didn't have uh, homes. And um, my troubles began to compound fairly rapidly. I was born with a facial paralysis um, that um, would uh, wind up haunting me. Uh, there'd be bullying in my future. Uh, it was rough. I had to um, uh, go into foster care. My mom couldn't care for me, though she loved me a great deal. Um, and, um, and my luck changed just a little bit because foster care was in upstate New York and actually not so bad. White picket fence, um, a, a very loving uh, foster family. There were brothers and sisters, a dog, um, very nurturing. Um, and um, uh, full of warmth, um, uh, unconditional love. Um, now, Mom, she, uh, she really liked me. <laughs> she wanted to come back after me and collect me. She ran into Jose in front of the Baruch houses in the Lower East Side, and uh, together they figured, you know what, let's make a go of this. Uh, they came up and got me, uh, but I had already been upstate for a couple of years, so this was a very, very strange environment to suddenly get tugged out of. I hadn't met mom uh, all that much during that time, so I was with uh, what I perceived to be strangers and uh, placed into what, is, uh, what was unfortunately uh, a dark and chaotic environment. Um, I was exposed to um, violence. Uh, as a, a, a three, four, five-year-old, I was exposed to uh, um, uh, abusers of drugs. Um, uh, it, uh, it became uh, a very dark world for me, a world that, um, that I, I, I didn't understand and wanted to escape from. Uh, I did this with, um, and mom helped out a little, uh, fairy tales, uh, mythology, and uh, this big guy. He was urban. <laughs> he hung out in cities. And in fact, he was kind of indestructible. Godzilla had this radioactive breath and nothing can harm him. And, uh, and I kind of liked that. Uh, I held on to, to that fantasy, cutting out little pictures of him in the TV guide and waiting for the 430 movie to cycle back every year so I could see uh, uh, Godzilla. Um, uh, nonetheless, um, the world was still uh, a spooky place, and um, uh, um, my mom had to struggle to figure out how to get us out of that situation. She had spirit, I'll tell you, and she um, eventually figured that if we're going to be poor, we might as well be poor in Hawaii. <laughs> 6,000 miles, by the way, closer to Godzilla. <laughs> appealed to me. Um, the Hawaii of the uh, mid-1970s was heavily influenced by Japanese popular culture, um, and um, I got into it right away. I had a friend named Sammy, and Sammy showed me a comic book that read backwards, um, and it was called Kikaider, and, um, and I looked at this thing, it was in Japanese, so he had to kind of translate uh, for me, and I was just enthralled. Look at this dude. <laughs> he has this incredible design. Remember, Yogi Bear, Bugs Bunny, this I knew. Kikaider? <laughs> that was wild. This dude was uh, um, a, a person who originally believed that he was a human being. Um, and when he realized that he was artificial, um, he began a quest for his very soul. Unfortunately, there were uh, dark uh, organizations that were after him because he's a bit of a weapon. And um, uh, they, um, they also, uh, for some reason, liked to harm children. And Kikaider, he's righteous. He would not let that happen. Um, and he was a protector of children. Now, the storyline ended, concluded. I was used to re reading Archie's or, or Batman. It went on forever in the United States. We Americans don't like anything to end. 
Uh, the Japanese, <laughs> it's over. Um, I said, Sammy, is this it? Where, where, where is the story? Um, he said, well, actually, if you want to see the story continue, it's going to be a live-action TV show airing in, in Kiku Television in Honolulu next week. It's going to start. Come watch it. And there he was, in the flesh, Jito, the man who turned into Kikaider. Uh, and when the chips were down, he'd leap on top of a mountain, strum that guitar, <laughs> a, a few chords, and accuse the monsters of not being righteous. Um, and, uh, and then he would come down and kick their ass. <laughs> And this was the 70s. They had no compunction about tearing each other's limbs off and beating them with each other. And, uh, and there he is in his uh, Canadian uh, tuxedo, um, <laughs> kicking butt. Uh, then when the chips were really down and the big bad monster came, Jiro would change, literally transform before our eyes into Kikaider. I was caught up in this. <laughs> Um, look, uh, I'm going to freely admit this. I didn't want to think about the fact, I was 12, that there was like a person in there. <laughs> he was a robot. <laughs> he was Jiro. I suspended um, uh, uh, my, uh, my, my disbelief, and I was with him all the way, immersing myself, watching him do battle uh, with these monsters. Now, the series ended after 42 uh, episodes. Boom! Again! And at the end of this, everybody died. And the bad guy got away. And then it's over. The storyline was done. I said, Sammy, what's with this? Um, is this really how it ends? He says, actually, no. You have to go to the movies. They're going to release Kikaider the motion picture, where he will make a final stand against Professor Gill. And, um, uh, and that will be the true end of the show. I said, Where, where's this movie? He says, outside of town. <clears throat> you can't go there. We're not allowed. I said, oh, yes, I am. I got on that bus by myself. I spent that dime. Uh, and, um, and, and, and this theater outside of Honolulu, it was so old, it was kind of leaning over, <laughs> like in an earthquake. Stuff was moving around on the floor. I paid my 99-cent admission, got my 3D glasses, because it was in 3D, and watch Kikaider kick the ass of all 42 monsters from the show before getting to the bad guy. It was so bad, he had to call his brother, Kikaider01, from a whole other TV series <laughs> to come in and help him defeat the guy. He did. And in the end, they got on their crazy motorcycles and rode off into the subset with that sad Japanese music that they always put at the end. I was hooked. Hooked, hooked. I bought all the toys, read the magazines, um, bought the posters. Uh, this is what I wanted to do. I'd have to wait a while. <laughs> I'd have to wait a while. Well, you know, the vacation was over. Um, Mom decided we were going to go back to New York. It was the late 70s, which was a dark time for New York City. And um, uh, those rich texts that surrounded me in Honolulu, uh, began to gradually fall away, and um, I fell into the mood of the city, and also the events of my past began to kind of crawl back and haunt me. I became concerned about what was behind doors. I always had to make sure the door was closed. I locked the door, walked away, and then had to go back to check to make sure I locked the door over and over and over again. Um, it was as if uh, every thought in my mind um, had become fractured a little bit and fragmented, lighting up all over the place and rushing at, at the same time. I would hear sounds almost that repeated and repeated and repeated, checking drawers, um, becoming concerned that, um, uh, that nightmarish figures were going to uh, appear. I began to look for fragments of those images in movies and TV shows and in novels. I wound up haunting uh, the theaters that showed those grindhouse horror films in Times Square. Those were not safe places for a 14 or 15 year old kid. I don't even know how they let me in, but there I was searching um, through these uh, horrific, um, gory images 
trying to have them match for some bizarre reason the things that were in my head. Eventually, I had to begin to express them. And you know, I would write endlessly on sheets of paper, being so ashamed of what I was writing <laughs> that I wrote them tiny, <clears throat> so tiny that if you picked up the paper, you wouldn't even know what was going on there. Thousands of pages, which I then would destroy. <clears throat> um, uh, always trying to express these things. There wasn't even any narrative in there, people. No story at all. Just thousands and thousands of dark, dark, fractured images. It led me to uh, bad places and, and poor decisions. Um, I, um, I was... Uh, I really, really um, I could not make this go away by myself. I was aware that something was wrong, but could not communicate it with anybody because it was so awful. I found myself um, on, on the floor, literally, in, in a bad location, and, um, and I thought that this would be it. This would be uh, over. And, um, and in, in those thoughts, it was weird. It was as if I started communicating with myself, and the thing that took shape was a darker form of Kiter from my childhood. And he said to me, what are you doing? <laughs> accusing me, accusing me of not being righteous, accusing me of, of not protecting the children. Um, and, um, and was that what I was, a monster? I, I began to fantasize about that dialogue, um, uh, accusing him, who are you? How can you be in this realistic environment? Uh, and I began to think about how that could be. What could a world be like with Kikaider alive in it? Um, and I began to be amused by the thought and construct this kind of a fictional universe that could somehow allow for this strange juxtaposition. The act of doing this took this tangle in my mind and everything sort of kind of came into a form of order. It was as if all the lights that had been flickering <laughs> constantly in my brain at least was given some kind of focus. There was still a little chaos there, but something was happening, and I enjoyed the feeling of every nook and cranny being filled in my mind. I had to express it. Some of you may recognize this right off the bat, people. Yes, I took <laughs> the geek way out. Um, uh, I, I could not uh, play with my action figures anymore. I certainly didn't want to be in those uh, dark places. I began to make up stories and convince people with this elaborate rule system that Dungeons and Dragons supplied you um, that we could tell stories together. Um, and um, uh, we would, uh, 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 what I would do is because some of the guys that, that played Dungeons and Dragons with me were tough guys, I would find out from them their aspirations. I'd question them. I'd talk, they'd talk about what it is that they'd like to do in a story, and I would subtly integrate it into the narrative. And together, we were collectively unfolding this incredible tale that would be fleshed out on this fantasy world uh, called Corridor um, in, in enormously rich detail. It wasn't so much about every blade of grass. It wasn't so much about um, uh, uh, the, the kind of geeky atmospherics of, of, of science and biology on this world. It was about the characters and the journey that they made. And because I stuck with character, it allowed for me to sell um, my Dungeons & Dragons world uh, to Wizards of the Coast <laughs> and um, uh, write comic books for acclaimed comics based on this world. Um, somehow I'd figured out how to make a living telling these stories and, and projecting my imagination. 
with um, uh, Magic the Gathering, I told the story in a comic book, but it was based on a trading card game. Uh, I used something new in the mid-90s called the Internet to uh, supply the fans with supplementary information about this world. And uh, the storyline would climax in the form of a video game. Somehow, these companies let me do this. It was as if each instrument that I had access to could somehow, in maybe a little bit of an awkward way, be put together and made into kind of uh, a narrative symphony. Well, I got good at it. <laughs> People began coming to me. Companies, can you do this for Pirates of the Caribbean? For Transformers? Um, even things that didn't have stories attached to them. Coca-Cola, can you make a, a, a narrative with, um, with these characters from this commercial and sell more of our sugar water? Sure, uh, as long as the story was good. Um, Halo, amazing. A uh, year and a half spent uh, working on Halo, helping uh, Microsoft improve the narrative uh, in the Halo mythology, and Halo reaches the manifestation of it. Tron um, and Avatar, fantastic. There I am standing with James Cameron, um, uh, helping to extend the universe of Avatar across all these different media platforms. Um, these were effective, tremendously so, uh, because I took these worlds as seriously as I remember taking these worlds. Um, uh, the, uh, the current uh, culmination of, of this career in transmedia storytelling um, occurred when the PGA ratified a credit called Transmedia Producer. Um, now, we can be uh, credited for pulling together these narratives and helping companies bridge uh, the various platforms as you've been hearing all day. It is truly fantastic watching this happen all over the world and being able to speak to people uh, about this shift in paradigms with regard to storytelling. Um, uh, but uh, I want to shift gears for these final moments today to talk about something that I am taking very, very seriously and I hope that you will consider it. When we think about these meta-texts, these deep, deep narratives, um, uh, we can think about something like religion, a system of symbols and texts which establish powerful, long-lasting moods in people by telling us stories that make sense in our reality stating these stories as absolute fact, which makes these moods uniquely realistic. What was I telling you about Kikaida? I bet some of you have fans of football or baseball who really, really believe. Um, there are a lot of, 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 uh, of these texts that are, uh, are currently in the world right now which are only going to be vastly, exponentially increased in terms of their power with transmedia. We, as transmedia storytellers, must be aware that there is a peril in this. In Japan, there is a, um, uh, a group within the otaku um, fandom. Um, these are hundreds of thousands of young adults who are obsessed with something called moe, um, this is the um, eroticization of uh, little girls in animated uh, 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 segments. And um, at uh, uh, best, it's kind of like wallpaper. There are barely any narratives in Moe. Um, and at worst, it's a kind of uh, pornography. They're getting off on uh, these non-narratives. Uh, in fact, what they're doing is breaking down these little girls according to their eye color, according to their headgear, according to how short or long their skirts are, the colors of their panties, in little databases that they keep and share with one another. The narratives, if any, don't count for anything. Uh, on the far end, uh, transmedia can be used to convey pseudo-facts and, um, and to convey worldviews uh, that um, uh, play to, to the base nature of, of people and, uh, and, and can stir up 
incredible and highly convincing um, uh, movements that, um, that threaten to uh, be very destructive. So in short, uh, uh, transmedia, uh, it, it can be used to mislead. We can become isolated. We can become addicted. We can be lost in mundanity, the endless everyday. Trust me when I say this is possible because I've experienced it myself. Transmedia, within a few years, can be rigged to seem to listen to you, um, to offer you what you want. But really, people, only human beings um, can give you what you need. Um, we are storytellers. Um, we have to tap our audiences into what uh, I'm calling, and you've been hearing references to this all day, the grand narrative. The grand narrative that formed those initial religions, that formed the epic poems and the great novels, the things that made us question who we are and go out in search of our very souls. Um, we have to teach people to question reality. If I didn't know during those first couple of years, what, what, what love was, what, what nurturing was, what warmth was, I would have accepted the chaos as the norm. I would have been lost in the endless everyday of the Baruch projects. Do you understand? I knew something was wrong, and I was able to dislodge myself from it and become, well successful in that I connected with a beautiful woman and have a beautiful child. <laughs> and I make a little bit of a living. We have to teach people to make those connections with other human beings, and we have to teach them to truly listen. We have to provide an architecture that allows for people to lift themselves from darkness and mundanity. That's our jobs. I leave you with... I'm just imploring you, keep me human. Keep me human with your work. Keep one another human. Thank you. Thank you.